Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson. It feels so good to win, doesn't it? It does. It feels so good to win, especially when uh, a win for us is a lose for our arch rival, some Oxford. Bulldogs now at a 3-1 and record against Ole Miss this year. It's been a tough year. There's at least one thing we can feel good about. Bulldogs have won 21 of the last 27 baseball games against Ole Miss. I ran the math this morning. In the last 13 seasons, Ole Miss owns a winning record against the Bulldogs one time. And that was way back in 2015 when they won the Governor's Cup and swept the series. Interestingly enough, Mike Bianco is now 47-70 and 70 against Mississippi State. So the winningest coach in program history, 23 games below 500 against your Diamond Dogs. That's right. That's right. In the glory days of Ole Miss baseball, Mississippi State still owns Ole Miss. Yeah, yeah. Put that in your pipe and smoke it right there. So, uh, you know, pretty crazy. I believe that's correct. I got a spreadsheet set up here. Let me double check that because it may uh, may actually be calculating wrong. I, oh, I'm sorry. 41 and 49. Yes. So, yeah, eight games under 500. I, I thought that seemed like a lot of games. But, nevertheless, the Bulldogs on a winning record against Ole Miss during the heyday of their program when uh, both teams won an AFL championship. So even when they're good, head-to-head, we're better. Simple as that. That's a tough thing to live with, isn't it? I mean, it is, honestly. It's like that 14 football season for us, as great as it was, we still couldn't beat those guys. 2015, good season for us in football. We lose the Egg Bowl in Dak's final home game. It stinks, man. It does. But on the baseball side of things, we still run this state. Uh, also interesting to point out again, and we'll do it again, Bulldogs win the Golden Egg. Bulldogs end up with a top 20 finish. Bulldogs get the better ball game and win it. Bulldogs sweep on the men's basketball side. Bulldogs take three out of four on the baseball side. Uh, rumor has it that uh, those powder blue, we run the SIP shirts, are now on clearance as well they should be. You run your mouth. You don't run the sip. Maybe that's a shirt we can sell. You run your mouth. Now, the Bulldogs run the state of Mississippi. What a great academic year and athletic year it's been within the rivalry. Now, if we can salvage something in this baseball season and still you know, find a way to get into an NCAA regional, which um, you know those prospects are getting slimmer by the day, but today we're going to celebrate a win, and then uh, after I record the show, I'm going to get on the road to Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, be there for the uh, three-game weekend series that begins on Thursday. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday this week. So your Friday show will be recorded in Knoxville uh, following that game. So it won't be a Thursday night show, but we'll get up Friday morning and record that for you. So on the road to Knoxville. So i got to make sure we pack the mic and bring it with us. Uh, but nevertheless... Bulldogs had a big win. We'll recap that here in the first segment of the show. Got a really interesting top 10 list for you today. I uh, don't know how long we go. We may not go to the full 90 minutes because I've got to get going sooner rather than later. But the uh, reality of it is, Bulldogs take care of business. And uh, how interesting is it, too, that Mississippi State, we go out here, State and Ole Miss pitching both struggle, and we end up with four pitching duels. It's crazy how baseball works. State a 2-1 winner. Uh, last night I was there on location in Pearl uh, many of you were too not what it normally is I, I saw some complaints on Twitter about some price gouging and paying for parking and all that kind of stuff it's tough man there nowadays especially when we play games like this there is the novelty aspect of the Bulldogs bringing the show to your town or reasonably close to your house and some of these venues are definitely pushing up ticket pricing and things of that nature so it's not just the novelty of the whole thing anymore you know, it's become a bit of a money grab for a lot of people. And I think the uh, an, a t- announced attendance last night, if I remember correctly, was uh, 6601. Nearly 2,000 below the record for attendance. The state in Ole Miss said uh, 2014? Yeah, I think it's right. But uh, nevertheless, we win the game, and uh, our team's able to hoist the Golden Cup for the fifth time in six years. It's 
been quite the stretch. 2016 till now. Kind of started with the Jake Mangum years, and it's still going. And I recall Peyton Plumley tweeting at me after we won the series and said, Steve, the Governor's Cup still must win. It is. And we get the dub. So we're going to take a little time here. We're going to thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company, and we're going to we're going to get after this recap. Not a lot to recap, but what a great pitching performance on both sides. State, um, state able to kind of the beneficiary of a pretty big mistake by Ole Miss that uh, turned out to be the difference in the ballgame. A couple mistakes in that crazy sixth inning. But our friends at Bulldog Burger Company, they're here to serve you, and uh, you should go out there and check out Bulldog Burger Company every chance you get. There's just so much out there involved with the Bulldog Burger Company experience that makes you feel really good about life. That great restaurant quality hamburger, it's available in three locations now. University Drive here in Star Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, Lake Harbor Drive in the Rich and Flowood area. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. Have the spring rolls as your appetizer. They will make you and everybody around you better looking. I'm a big proponent of dessert to go. Get that chocolate shake. Last time I got one was Nutella. I got the Nutella shake to go and uh, rode that ride home with a smile. I want to make you aware, too, uh, on May the 5th, for those of you in Tupelo, you know, we had the uh, the first big live music event at the Tupelo Bulldog Burger Company, and it was a huge success. A lot of people turned out, and uh, there's some anticipation of a new event that's going to happen Friday, May 5th. Local artist Del Rushing will be performing at Bulldog Burger Company in Tupelo. Make sure you turn out for that. May 5th, Dale Rushing, performing live, Bulldog Burger Company, Tupelo. Uh, sponsored, as always, by Cat Hat Vodka. The fun's going to get started around 6 p.m. So you get off work, and maybe you want to have an adult beverage, kind of wind down a little bit, you can listen to Dale, kind of serenade you with some good tracks there. So Dale Rushing, May 5th, 6 p.m. at Bulldog Burger Company in uh, Tupelo. But you don't need live music to have a great experience even though it helps. Pick any of their three locations to serve you. You'll be glad you did. Bulldog Burger Company, a place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right, let's get into this recap here. Uh, Bulldogs needed a dub. You know how it is. Even when you win the weekend series, it's like, you know what? Man, I I don't want to run the risk of um, those guys being able to claim they split with us. Because even though... The SEC games matter more because they impact, uh, you know, your postseason stuff. You want to get that dub over Ole Miss. It doesn't matter if if they give us a trophy or not. Anytime that you have an opportunity to play those guys, you want to win the game. And we did. Ball game was played in just two hours and 46 minutes. It seemed like it was longer than that. Traffic's kind of tough getting in and out of there. By the time I left, you guys were already gone. But uh, Rebels, the home team, so Bulldogs get the first crack at it. Former weekend starter for Ole Miss, Grayson Sanye, the starter in the ballgame. He was on the weekends. They moved him off the weekends, made him the midweek guy. So nine starts under its belt. So this is a guy that has uh, competed against SEC. I think after the Florida series, they uh, moved him out of the weekend and eventually uh, moved Quinn there to Sunday. So this is the guy, too. Like, I've read some comments, too. People are like, well, I'm surprised we didn't do more against their second stringers. Well, we didn't play their second stringers. How's that be, right? So, Sanye, obviously a guy with weekend experience under his belt, and then every reliever we faced on Tuesday are the same relievers that we faced during the weekend series. So, Ole Miss threw their weekend arms in the ballgame. By and large, we didn't. And still won the game. All right, so top of first, David Marchand, uh, again, back in the lineup, playing well. I don't care who starts. Didn't make any difference to me. I just want to win the ball game. And I think right now David Marchand gives us the best chance to win a ball game at shortstop. And he's proven that. All right, so he's, but he strikes out looking here. Lengthy at bat, but he strikes out looking. Colton Ledbetter doubles to right field. Kind of gets things rolling there. And then Hunter Hines, three pitches later, takes a 2-0 pitch. I thought off the bat it was gone. It would have been out of Duty Noble Field in most college parks, but it ends up being a ground rule double. The run scores, and then DJ walks, and you feel like you got Sanye on the ropes here just a little bit. 
but we don't get the ball out of the infield with our final two swings here. Uh, Kellum Clark strikes out swinging, and Slade Alford uh, uh, out at first. Taps it to first base. He throws to Sanye. And so they get out of the jam there. Could have been a much bigger inning for us. We could have used a crooked number there. But you like to be able to send Sierra, the freshman, out there with a lead. It's so much easier to pitch with a lead. All right, bottom one, Jacob Gonzalez, who uh, moved up in the order and was hitting leadoff. They, they did make some changes. McCants nor Chardonnay uh, started in the ballgame. McCants didn't make a pinch hitting uh, appearance later in the ballgame. But uh, Wood started at second base in place of Chardonnay. Uh, Kramer in the lineup uh, in left as they move everybody around. Alderman, I think, was in right. Uh, but McCants didn't start. All right, Gonzalez grounds out to second, and then Ethan Groff flies out to right field. That's a guy, Ethan Groff, of course, from Tulane that uh, you know, had a good weekend against us last year. And State recruited him a little bit. He was never a priority recruit from Mississippi State, despite some reports to the contrary. There were a lot of people said he was close to committing to Mississippi State when State hadn't even talked to him yet, hadn't even offered him a scholarship. Uh, but Groff flies out to right, and you kind of wonder, too, is, is this guy second-guessing his decision? Honestly, last place team in the SEC. All right, uh, Kemp Alderman walked on a full count, and then Calvin Harris grounds out the first. A pretty efficient inning here, and you look at the walk there, but, you know, hey, that thing went to a full count. We just didn't get a call. All right, top of second. State right back to work. Hancock rifles one through the right side there. And then Amani Larry pops out the short left, the shortstop has a Gonzalez. High fill fouls outside of first. So the first time through the order, State had three hits, all three of them coming from left-handers. Ledbetter, Hines, and Hancock. Mershon then strikes out swinging, another lengthy at bat. But, uh, you know, Mershon kind of snaps a streak there of uh, reaching base in the first inning. And in his second appearance, uh, strikes out again. That's fine. He's going to be a good kid, going to be a good player for us. Bottom of second. Uh, Ethan Leger single to center field. There goes the no-hitter, right? <laughs> Clark, okay, swinging, and then Furness on a fielder's choice here. Uh, we force Leger at second and then get Kramer to fly out. So, again, traffic on the bases here for Sierra in the first couple of innings, but really nothing doing. You know, you, you don't add to your own trauma here. You know, that's the big thing here. All right, top of third, State goes one, two, three. Ledbetter flies out to ride on a full count. Hines strikes out swinging. And then Jordan, kind of a routine fly ball to center. We need two, three, and four to be consistent for us. We have not been as of late. We'll get it going again. All right, bottom of third, Brock Tapper comes in in place of Evan Sierra. And um, he gets Wood to strike out swinging. And one of the things that I loved about Tapper coming in and even though he ended up having some issues control-wise here, he comes out of the bullpen throwing strikes. Gets ahead 0-2 here. We kind of nibble a little bit. We don't get him. We get a case swinging. Then we get Gonzalez to fly out to right. So you think, hey, we're going to get out of this thing quickly. First pitch strike to Groff. And then you look up, it's a 3-1 count. Give me over strike is in. And then we end up walking him. So you hate that. It's like you have a chance to get out of there 1-2-3 inning, uh, even when you get ahead in the count. And then Alderman singles to left field. And Alderman is really having a big year for Ole Miss. He really is. Tough to hit it out of that ballpark last night. It's a big part of his game. But uh, he stayed able to keep him in the yard. And for the most part, off the bases. And then Calvin Harris walks. Calvin's not a guy that can really hurt you, but he's a very tough out. And here, this is a good example. Again, State gets ahead here. It ends up being a 2-2 count. We end up walking them with back-to-back pitches. So that loads the bases here. And right now, you're all thinking they're fixing the score. But instead... We get Leger to pop up, and uh, Luke gets it. That ends the inning. That was a big sequence right there. We get the first two outs, and then the next three Rebels reach base. We're able to get out of it with some soft contact. All right, top of four, uh, Kellum Clark. Just, game's kind of played him a little bit tough right now, but uh, had a big Sunday at Auburn. He'll be fine. I expect a big weekend from Kellum this weekend uh, in Knoxville. But he grounds out to the pitcher, and then Slade is hit by the pitch. Luke grounds the ball towards second, and uh, they elect to, to force Slade at second. Probably should have gone the first here. They do get the lead runner, bit of a gamble. It was a close play, but he was out. But it was an interesting decision you know, by your backup second baseman. Then Amon Larry walks, and so you got a chance here, kind of make some things happen. Uh, they pull Sanye and bring in Braden Jones, and then Highfill uh, grounds out to the pitcher. 
So again, traffic on the bases for the Bulldog. We couldn't push him around. Bottom of four. Uh, Tapper still in. He walks Calarco and then rolls up the double play. Furness is a walking double play candidate. It's a 4-6-3. Nice turn. It's short there by Marshawn. And then Kramer flies out to center field. So while you did have the walk there, you faced a minimum in the inning. Nice play by the Bulldog defense. Top of five. Marshawn grounds out to second on an 0-2 count. Ledbetter then flies out to center. Lengthy at bat there. And then Hines grinds it out, grinds it out, grinds it out, and then rolls out to first. Still one at the ball game now, mid five. Our Parker Sinet comes in. Parker Sinet, you guys know, is an Oxford native. I wrote a piece about him this morning. Uh, really good outing, his best outing of the season. Uh, struck out three in the ball game, worked three innings of play. And uh, the, the one run that Ole Miss got, we kind of assisted in that just a little bit. But here in the fifth, he gets wood to strike out swinging, very efficient, gets ahead here, gets ahead, 0 2. Uh, you throw the, uh, the the purpose pitch, try to get him a chase. He wouldn't, and then we get him on the slider. Gonzalez then flies out to right. And again, getting ahead there. Groff grounds out to third. So one, two, three inning of nine, one, two. And top of six, State here expands the lead. They bring in Sam uh, Tokian, and I, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. I tweeted it out wrong. And I thought, it's almost like I'm calling him Toucan Sam, and then maybe that's part of the nickname. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, that's a guy that's pitched against us. We saw him in the weekend. He gets DJ to strike out swinging here. However, it's a pass ball. I think they ruled it a pass ball. I think it might have actually been a wild pitch. But nevertheless, DJ, heady baseball here, runs it out, gets to first base. So the strikeout is recorded, but there is no out. So the pitcher gets credit for the strikeout, but there's no out posted on the board. DJ then still second base. Uh, Kellum flies out to left, wasn't deep enough to advance the runner. But they ended up gifting us the base anyway. They try to pick DJ off at second. There really wasn't much chance of that. They throw the ball into center field. DJ takes third. Slate strikes out swinging. And Ole Miss a chance to get out of the inning here. They get ahead of Hancock 0-2. And Luke, trying to go the other way, hits a routine fly ball to left. And they misplay it. He comes in and comes in, and all of a sudden he loses it. I don't know if it was in the lights or in the sky. I think Bianco said post game it was just dusk, and he just didn't pick it up. And then the ball gets over his head, and it drops for a double. Dakota comes around and scores, makes it two nothing. So really, I mean, honestly, you know, State gifted a run here, gifted a base runner, right? We steal it, then they gift us third, and then they gift us home. Bad teams find a way to lose. All right, bottom of six. Right back out of here. Alderman strikes out looking. That's big. Harris grounds out the short, and Leger pops up the second. And one of the things that I love about this one is how we attack the hitters here. We went right at them. All right, top of seven. State goes one, two, three. High full pops out to short left, and Gonzalez has it. Mershon flies out to left on the first pitch, and then Ledbetter flies out to center field. Bottom of seven, we're, it's a 2-2 two -two count. We get down 2-0 in the count. We work it back even, and then uh, Stinnett plonks Calarco. And you start thinking here, there's not much length in this Ole Miss order. There's really not. Once you get to the first four hitters, there's not a lot of, body, there's not a lot of people that are going to hurt you. And then Furness singles to right field. The runner goes around to thirds. Now runners on the corners with nobody out. And you think, okay, they're probably going to get a run here. Whether it be a ground ball to the right side or a sack fly or a wild pitch or something, they're going to get a run here. That's kind of how you feel. We get Kramer to strike out swinging. And what a big punch out that was because now you start thinking, hey, we're a ground ball away from getting out of this thing. Well, we do get the ground ball. However, it wasn't hit hard enough for us to turn two. Just kind of a, you know, Sunday hop out there to second. And so um, we take the runner at first, run scores, makes it 2-1, and then we get Gonzalez. And that's the thing, too. Gonzalez coming up you know, with two outs in a tie ball game and a runner in scoring position, and we get him just, you know, ground ball to short, to second base, excuse me. And uh, so it's 2-1, so we navigate through that. But, again, you know, the, the run that scores, you know, reach base on the hit by pitch. And you begin to think about, it. of course, the sequence of pitches changes. You know, everybody's like, well, if this has happened, uh, you, you pitch things differently when there's guys on base. You just do. The strategy changes. Your pitch selection changes. 
But, you know, we gift him a base runner, and he ultimately comes around and scores. Our top of eight, they bring in Mason Nichols, and he gets Hunter Hines. I thought Nichols looked good. He didn't look good against us on the weekend. He looked good in this ballgame. Hines strikes out swinging. Jordan strikes out looking. Lengthy at bat there. It's a strike. Foul, 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 ball, ball. And then he takes a fastball right down the middle, 94 miles an hour, right down the pipe. Wasn't expected to get the fastball. DJ was really upset with himself. Uh, Clark then strikes out swinging, and they uh, they have to throw him out at first. They do. So Tyson Harden comes in the bottom of eight. And listen, this Tyson Harden thing is something they've really worked on. They're trying to find you know some depth and build some guys for the weekend. Harden's the guy. So working on a sinker when he's on top of his game, he's getting guys to beat the ball in the ground. Uh, had some challenges here in this one, but we didn't wait around. Uh, he gets Groff to strike out looking, and then Alderman singles back up the box and takes second on a wild pitch. Now all of a sudden, you know, time runs in scoring position with less than two outs, and then we walk Calvin Harris. Tough out. We get ahead in this count one, two, and can't finish him. So we go get KC. And I don't know about you guys, but uh, here as of late, when KC comes in the ball game, I expect good things to happen. Sometimes we overextend him a little bit, trying to steal some outs. But when he came in the ball game, I felt we're probably okay here. What does he do? He gets Leger to strike out looking, and then Calarco to strike out swinging. And it never really felt at any point that the hitters were in charge of these encounters. I thought KC was very relaxed. I thought KC's breaking ball was filthy. I thought KC was getting a lot of swing and miss. And I just kind of get the sense when he comes in the game, the team kind of settles down a little bit. I know he had the rough ending the other day uh, on Saturday at Auburn. We're trying to kind of stretch him a little bit, and that's just what you do, man. I mean, it's not, it's not a reflection of KC. That kid's out there on fumes trying to win a ball game for his team. But when he comes in in this middle relief role, KC can be deadly. He really can be. All right, top of nine, we, we could use an insurance run here. We don't get it, but, um, you know, we have a chance to get a little traffic on the bases. Uh, Slate flies out to right, Hancock grounds out to short, and then Imani Larry comes through and uh, knocks the ball into center field for a single. Pretty well-struck ball there. Then he's still second. So now all of a sudden, you know, an insurance run up there for Ross, and uh, we strike out swinging. Ross, uh, you know, kind of scuffing a little bit right now, but he'll be fine. He's improved so much defensively. Not to mention people understand the power that he has. He's not going to get a lot of fastballs. All right, bottom of nine, Aaron Nixon's in the ball game trying to close this thing out. And some people wondered why we, we go get him in a midweek game. Guys, we've got to win a ball game. And it's Tuesday. And we're asking him to go one inning, right? And so he is a closer for a reason. And we have a chance to close out an RPI game, and we're going to need every RPI percentage point we can get. Not to mention the fact, when did we ever get to a point that not beating Ole Miss was a good thing? Like I read some comments on my own message board. I was like, how did, why are we diminishing a win over? Well, they're the last place team in the league. Well, that's true. It's still Ole Miss. When has that ever mattered? Anytime you get a chance to beat Ole Miss in anything from, you know, baseball to college football to Chinese checkers to tiddlywigs, you want to win the game. Not to mention, this guy's a closer. And Aaron Nixon needs to work. And he comes out and does an outstanding job for you here. He gets Burford to strike out swinging. Lengthy at bat, but he finally gets the punchy. McCann's then grounds out to second. And then Uttermark strikes out swinging on three pitches. So nice work there for Aaron Nixon, who I picked up his second save here in a few days. Let's take a quick look at the box score here. Again, just three scoring plays. And again, the, the, yeah, that's the thing you look at. We, we want to talk about earn, run, average, and that kind of stuff. You know, hey, we went back-to-back doubles in the first, and the other two runs in the ball game that were scored really came because of defensive miscues by either State or Ole Miss. All right, Dave Marchano, 0 for 4. A couple punch outs there. He'll be okay. Colton Ledbetter, 1 for 4. Hunter Hines, 1 for 4 with that RBI in the first inning. Dakota Jordan, 0 for 3. Did get the walk and, of course, uh, caused some anxiety for the Rebels. Kellum Clark, 0 for 4 with a couple punch outs. So he'd offered 0 for 3 with a strikeout. Luke Hancock, 2 for 4 with an RBI. Uh, on, and that's on that misplay ball and left. Amani Larry, 1 for 3. Also had a walk. Ross Highfield, 0 for 4. But, uh, you know, we didn't have a great offensive night. We had just enough. And sometimes that's what, you, that's what it requires. I mean, I'd love to win with style points. But uh, what's interesting, both teams struck out 10 times. Yeah, 10 times last night. State actually... Uh, uh, 
a little better job here, I think, um, when it came to kind of managing things. You manufacture run there, kind of with their help. But uh, looking at pitching numbers, Evan Sierra credited with the win, the first of his college career. Two innings pitch, the hit, uh, a walk, one strikeout. Just 24 innings pitched. He'll be available this weekend if we need him. Brock Tapper, two innings of work, one hit, no runs, three walks. We had five, and three of them came from Brock. Uh, two of them in that big inning, and we were able to navigate out of that. One strikeout, 39 pitches, so he didn't throw enough to hurt himself. Parker Stinnett, and how big could he be, man? That's the thing you think about. There've been Parker's been so up and down at times, and a lot of that's been associated with injuries, but uh, he's probably got the best stuff on the staff. It's just being able to control it and throw it consistently for strikes. And when he can't throw the slider for a strike, the fat ball, the fastball is just not dynamic enough to get to blow people away. In his case, as I noted in the article, the fastball kind of plays off the slider, not the other way around. It's a good complimentary pitch, but if he can't throw the slider for a strike, people just sit dead red fastball. Last night, the slider was filthy. A lot of bite in the slider, a lot of depth in the slider. A lot of swing and miss on the slider. Again, three punch outs. The one hit, uh, one run, of course, on the, the hit by pitch. But uh, Parker, 46 pitches last night, threw longer than anybody, faced more hitters than anybody. Really quality middle relief appearance here at Parker's to net. Tyson Harden uh, comes in, just gets one out, allows a hit, there's a walk. And in a one run ball game, you just can't sit there and work with him, let him figure it out. And they want to get him going. They do. They really do. They think that he's a guy that can help us, and he's going to need to. But uh, just 12 pitches for Harden, so he'll be available should we need him. Uh, KC, just nine pitches thrown. Incredible, incredible nine pitches thrown. And he gets two strikeouts in those nine pitches. And uh, that's what two runners on. That, that's a high leverage inning right there. And KC coming through, getting things taken care of for you. And then Nixon comes in and closes the ball game out. Very efficient work for him. One inning pitch, two strikeouts. No hits, no runs. 16 pitches. One ground out, two punches, 16 pitches. And uh, so, yeah, he's fine. Trust me, he could, he could probably throw today if he needed to. Uh, Grayson Sanye from Ole Miss tagged in a loss. Kind of looking up and down their order real quick here. Uh, Kemp Alderman, yeah, arguably their best player this year. He had a couple of hits. He had four hits on the night. He had two of them. Leger had a single. Furnace had a single. And uh, State kind of navigates through all that stuff. But the um, reality of it is, is we beat Ole Miss. That's never an insignificant thing, no matter the sport, no matter the circumstances, uh, because of the fact that we recruit against those guys head-to-head so often. You need to win. And again, State dominating the series, dominating the rivalry in college baseball. That's probably a tough thing to live with. Bulldogs now 24-17 and 17 overall. Ole Miss drops to 21-20. and 20. Now, before you start tripping – I still think Ole Miss has a chance to end up with a winning record. And they, may, they still may pass us in the standings. Even though we got a three-game lead, their schedule much more favorable than ours. Uh, but, you know, as far as in-state supremacy goes and head-to-head competition, uh, we got them. So better luck next year, Rebs. That's just something you're probably used to hearing. All right, time for today's top ten list is always brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R.com. Blair Chandler, a mortgage professional. A lot of people want your business. Blair deserves it. Give Blair a call or text today at 601-500-2344. Again, that's 601-500-2344. That goes directly to him. And if you mention to him you heard about him on the barnyard, he's going to pay for your appraisal, which is about a $500 value. And here's the thing, too. You don't need to entrust something as important as your mortgage to just anybody. 21 years of experience, 22, I guess now, three years, back-to-back-to-back, top 1% close ratio in the company. Works for Fairway Mortgage, a very reputable uh, mortgage company. And so I understand a lot of people out there say, hey, you know, we want to do business with these people or that people. And, you know, it's one thing to go get your car washed. It's not a thing to entrust your home into the hands of somebody that may or may not be able to do a good job. Stick with the winners, and that's Blair Chandler at closewithblair.com. All right, let's talk top 10 today. I don't know why it hit me, but I was thinking last night on the way home about, you know, when did music change? You know, I'm from the 1900s. Uh, many of you have heard some stories from your parents that are completely untrue. 
while I was listening to uh, your, your Megadeth and Metallica, uh, Guns N' Roses, Motley, those kind of bands, the hair bands too, right? Uh, they were listening to Debbie Gibson and Tiffany, New Kids on the Block. So when, when they speak to you authoritatively about music, uh, I'm here to tell you your parents are full of it, all right? So because as your good friend and host, I have a little more knowledge about this stuff, I'm going to share a few things with you. So we're going to go back to the year that I think things changed. A lot of people talk about how 91 was the year. I think you know, the genesis of change in rock music actually began in 1990. Yeah, 1990. And uh, there's a lot of things that were going on then, okay? Grunge was not a thing yet, but it was about to be. It was about to be. Uh, the hair metal experience was dying down. And you even saw some of that, even some of the bands, you know, of course, like Motley, of course, uh, you know, with Girls, Girls, Girls and Dr. Feel Good, like they had a pain for Motley, you know, that's all the spandex and pink and, you know, wild lavender and stuff like that. Then all of a sudden they go to Girls, Girls, Girls and everybody's riding motorcycles and putting their letter jackets on. Then Dr. Feel Good comes out and everybody's all ripped up with tattoos. So everybody was get, trying to get tougher and kind of get away from that um, more feminine image, I guess you could say. But music was changing, and it was. Now, there are some very important songs that came out in the year 1990. And so we're going to start. One of my favorite bands, we talked about them recently, is, you know, the What's Old is New. They have a brand new album out. It's a band, Extreme. Now, the second album from Extreme, the first album, I absolutely loved when I got it. You know, I was a Bill and Ted fan, and uh, Do You Want to Play was... Uh, Everywhere because of Nuna Bittencourt's phenomenal guitar play. But Kid Ego was a great song. But they followed up with Porno Graffiti, which was a tremendous success for them. And the song, that in many respects, has become the quintessential extreme song, is More Than Words. And uh, it's just Nuno and Gary Sharon just kind of sitting around playing. I guess Pat Badger, of course, is uh, tapping a little bit back there. But uh, this became an iconic song. It's still one of those today, and it's like, you know, the sentiment behind the song is like, you know, if you love me, you don't have to tell me all the time. I love to hear it, but, um, you know, more than words, right? I need you to show me that you love me, not just tell me, but uh, one of the great love songs of my generation, for sure. All right, number nine, one of the more important songs of my generation, too, uh, Klaus Meiner from the Scorpions. Scorpions, of course, a German band, and uh, many of you only read about this in history books. You know, when I, as a child of the 80s, you know, we grew up under the threat of nuclear war at all times during the Cold War. We, you know, we expected it. Everybody that was communist, of course, was our enemy. And every villain in every movie between America and, and whoever was Russian or whatever, or somebody from Germany. And, uh, you know, our parents, of course, and our grandparents, uh, many of them either fought in World War II or, you know, kind of grew up with... Um, you know, their, their parents being gone, or perhaps they grew up kind of understanding about, um, you know, colonialism and things of that nature. And uh, so it was a different time. It's like, I, I, sometimes I think today, and some of you will be offended by this, and that's okay. If I step on your toes, I hope it hurts. I don't know if the young people of today, in many respects, uh, fully appreciate the freedom in which they live with. I mean, honestly. Honest to goodness, that's, that's the truth. I mean, the, you, people today, it's like you read all this stuff and there's all these people with these hot takes and people that, you know, that were born like 10 years ago. Uh, they're trying to tell you about how life works. And I just think to myself, I mean, like w there was such a national pride, you know, in the 80s. And some of it, of course, is, you know, Hollywood, of course, you know, the, the Rocky Four movies. And of course, in 1980, uh, we beat Russia in the Olympics in hockey. It was incredible. It gave us a lot of self-esteem. Of course, you had Ronald Reagan, of course, our president from most of the 80s. There was a lot of national pride. It was. And a lot of it's because we knew we had to rely on each other. Because we thought, you know what, hey, if this thing ever happens. We all saw Red Dawn. And we're thinking, hey, if the Russians ever invade, I'm with these guys. Or I'm going to go in the woods here. We're going to make it. You watch that movie, it's so inspiring when you're a teenager because you think, hey, if these guys ever come to our home, 
They come to our homeland. We're going to set aside our differences, and we're going to band together as a people, and we're going to beat the Russians. And as naive as that sounds, in hindsight, that's how we felt. And nowadays, it's completely different, completely. But one of the most defining moments in world history is when the Berlin Wall came down, dividing the East and West Germany. Of course, the West Germans were our friends. The East Germans were our enemies. And as soon as that wall came down, I remember watching it. It's a surreal experience. When all that began to kind of fall apart, and I remember the, the guys reaching over and shaking hands from East and West Germany, and the Berlin Wall was coming down, and Klaus Miner from the Scorpions immediately went and sat down with tears streaming down his face, and he wrote this wonderful song, Wind of Change. I get chills even talking about it because, number one, that's his homeland, but it wasn't just something that impacted Germany. It impacted the entire world. And that song one of the more important songs of my generation. It's amazing. All right, number eight, and I've got this a little deeper on the list because it was, it's not necessarily one of my favorite songs, but there was a new band called Pantera, just beginning to hit the scene in 1990. They had not found their, uh, maybe their stride just yet, but they had this, this debut album that was phenomenal. And before this, Pantera was a, uh, you know, a typical Hair metal band. Yeah, before it was Don Bag Daryl. I think it was Diamond Daryl. I think that's right. Yeah, Diamond Daryl. You had the teased up here and everything. Well, things changed, and they changed along with it. The Abbott Brothers did, and then they brought us this great track, Cemetery Gates, number eight on today's list. Number seven. One of the most beautiful songs of my generation, and some people will disagree with me, but I will die on this hill. I had a chance to see this song being performed live. Many of you were with me in Jackson when Queensryche and Suicidal Tendencies came. It was an amazing night. Of course, it was the Operation Mindcrime slash Empire Tour. You got to see Mindcrime in its entirety, which is amazing, and some of the hits from Empire. One of the most beautiful songs ever written in my estimation is number seven on your list. It's Silent Lucidity. And uh, the premise of the song is it's apparent explaining the process of dreaming through a child. You know, it's like, you know, your mind tricked you that you were there and you were scared, you know. And uh, I can't even begin to imagine you know, kind of putting that together. And the music is great. The instrumentation is great. Jeff Tate's vocal performance is amazing. Uh, it's not a big rocking song, but Silent Lucidity, this is one of those songs, if... Uh, I turned my daughters on to this a while back, and they were they were pretty pleased with the song too. Of course, you know by by rule you can't love what your dad loves, at least not in front of him. But I remember putting it on, and and my daughter Audrey specifically was like, "This this is a beautiful song," and it absolutely is. It's not just the music itself; the lyrical content absolutely stellar. I probably have it too low on the list. Number six, one of the most uh, groundbreaking bands at the time. A band called Jane's Addiction. You're Perry Farrell, Dave Navarro, those guys. Uh, you know, Dave Navarro, of course, many of you know him from Ink Master. Uh, before he was an Ink Master, he was an Axe Master. And uh, playing in different tones and different tunings. And uh, Perry Farrell, a very much a visionary, the founder of Lollapalooza. This is a band that hit the scene. It really kind of changed things. And they, they hit their, the ground running with Ben called Stealing. Great track. All right, number five, I go back to this incredible debut album. I still listen to this thing in its entirety when I travel sometimes. Might do it today. But when, these, when this band hit, something was different. Now, they weren't following the grunge model. They weren't following the Hair Nation model. They weren't going, getting heavier like you know, Megadeth. This is a band that's kind of true to themselves. It's those sweet Georgia Peaches, the Black Crows. The very first single off the Shake Your Money Maker album is Jealous Again. And when this thing hit the radio, I was like, you know what? These guys have got a little something. And the next thing you know, they release twice as hard, and then it's, the, it's hard to handle, and she talks to angels. If, if you're a young person and you're just maybe getting into the Black Crows because now you're college age and you're allowed to do that, right? If you don't have Shake Your Money Maker, you owe it to yourself today to go download it. You do it. I'm just telling you, I've got every Black Crows album, and I can tell you, that's one of those ones right there when you found out Chris Robinson was the real deal. Jealous again, number five. Number four, 
one of the classic rock bands in American history and world history. They kind of broke here, you know, originally from Australia, had some ties to England, but really hit it big in the United States. It's ACDC. This is a bit of a comeback for them. They hadn't done anything in a while. They released this album. And now you, it's still an anthemic song. It's Thunderstruck. And I remember you know, when Money Talks came out and Mistress for Christmas, a lot of people were like, you know what? ACDC is back. But Thunderstruck, I mean, goodness, they played at every sporting event, right? Number four on your list. Now, this number three song, many of you would have it lower. And that's okay. That's okay. You have the right to be wrong. This is an amazing song, and I don't know that it gets enough acclaim. You had Jack Blades from Night Ranger. You had Tommy Shaw from Styx, one of the best vocalists of my generation, and then uh, Ted Nugent. Now, we're not going to talk about Ted's politics. I don't want anybody to get their feelings hurt, get your knickers in a twist over the Second Amendment or anything like that. I don't, I don't, we're not talking about that. We're just talking about music. They put together a super group called the Damn Yankees. Coming of Age was the first single, but the one to me, the, I bought the album probably within maybe a month of it being released. And the song that jumped out to me, the song that pulled me in, that still does, is Come Again from Damn Yankees off that debut album. The Damn Yankees have been great. They have a very nice catalog, very radio-friendly catalog, but man, the the musicians on that album are ridiculous, man. But uh, Come Again is uh, your number three song. And I think Tommy's vocal on this is some of the best of his career. All right, number two. This is kind of the last gasp of the Hair Nation generation here. We just talked about this band on uh, Monday show. And we're going back with it. It's number two on that list and number two on this list. It's Warren's Cherry Pie. Again, this was kind of the beginning of the end. Even though Warren and these bands were still selling out arenas, there was a thunder in the distance as things were changing. A lot of people, too. Um, you know, Image was such a big deal in the 80s, right? And things changed in the early 90s. And you know, like, nowadays, I mean, you, you can have a guy that looks like he just worked a double at Subway, walk up on stage and get a guitar, and people are like, oh, see, it's all about the music. No, it's not. No, it's not. You say that, but it's not. It's not. If, if a guy's having to work at Subway, the, the music isn't very good. But a lot of people nowadays, you know, it's like we, we get these strong opinions. But um, I like my rock stars to be rock stars. Maybe you see it differently. But, uh, but things were changing. And so we had kind of this anti-hero movement in music. It's like, oh, we're, we're kind of rebelling against everything, big hair and from the West Coast and from California. And a lot of that, too, uh, because there were a lot of people, while they liked the music, they just couldn't identify with all this. I mean, it's like, hey, we all want to grow up and be rock stars, right? Uh, Nickelback wrote a hit song about it. But that's what everybody wanted. It's like you see these guys on TV, they're larger than life, and all of a sudden you begin to have uh, you know, the undercurrent of something happening in Seattle where they look like us. And it's like, well, I got a flannel shirt in the closet. I got some cut-off blue jean shorts. I got some work boots. I could pull that look off. Maybe I can't get a leather jacket or some leather pants and grow my hair out long and tease it up. I, maybe I can't look like Motley Crue, but I can look like Pearl Jam. Now, we don't have a Pearl Jam song on our list because Pearl Jam hadn't been created, founded yet. Yeah, not 1990. The forerunner of grunge, and in many respects, kind of unfairly maligned as grunge, even though they are grunge right i say that because when alice and chains hit the ground they were a heavier version of what we were already hearing on rock radio there was a little mystery involved in them there was uh different tuning you know drop the tuning was becoming a thing and uh the melvins and alice and chains mud love bone those bands were all kind of pushing that out there but the reality of it is it's the first big band to break out of Seattle in the early 90s was Alice in Chains. And the track was Man in a Box off their first full-length album, Face Left, which is a classic album. I wore my Alice in Chains dirt shirt uh, a couple days ago. But that Face Left album is the one that kind of changed a lot in music. Because all of a sudden, I mean, people were like, well, who are these guys? You know, 
They look a little bit different. Is this an act? No, it wasn't. They sound a little bit different. Is this a flash in the pan? No, it wasn't. But there are a lot of people out there, there are a lot of people with a revisionist history that'll sit here and say, oh, Nirvana, Nirvana, Nirvana. And, and I'll be honest with you, I think a lot of my angst about all that is because of this. It's because Alice in Chains and Soundgarden were already doing it. And you're like, yeah, but Nirvana took it mainstream. No, they didn't. They didn't. I don't, I don't care what your, your Debbie Gibson uh, fan told you. That's not true. There's this revisionist history. Nirvana's contributions to music is undeniable. As much as I don't like them, I do think they were a flash in the pan. I think their lyrical content is absolute trash. But it's music was ripe for change. There would be no Nirvana without Alice in Chains and Soundgarden, period. That's my opinion. I'll die on that hill. And Alice in Chains was the first band from that Seattle scene. Even though Mother Love Bone and the Melvins and Streaming Trees and uh, Green River and those bands were doing some really cool stuff, they were kind of relegated to the Pacific Northwest. Melvins kind of had a following, but it was more of the lunatic fringe, right? It was like these people, they just kind of wanted to be different, get high and go to a show and look different, right? But Alice in Chains was the real deal. They were the forerunners of grunge. The John the Baptist of grunge, dare I say. And so that's number one for me, and uh, I'm, I'm wearing Jabot jeans right now, right? Because I'm, I'm still a product of the uh, late 80s, early 90s. But this facelift album began to change music probably more so than anything else. And you begin, you factor in, again, it's kind of a potpourri thing here. Like you've got classic rock with ACDC and Ted Nugent, and you've got James Addiction and Pantera, and Alice in Chains mixed in with, you know, Warren and Queen's Rack and extreme bands like that. It was very much a hodgepodge. And all of a sudden you begin to have these factions in music. And um, get, listen, grunge lasted like 15 minutes. I mean, people like, you know, as soon as grunge died, it became immortal, right? That's kind of how it happened. But it didn't last very long. People act like, oh, well, the entire 90s, man, music was good. Guys, grunge was over like in 92, truthfully. And then you had a few bands that survived that and uh, kind of evolved in time. But, uh, you know, we have this, you know, this nostalgia about the era because we kind of grew up in it. But the reality of it is grunge did not last very long. It didn't. And that you don't hear a lot of elements from grunge in today's music. I had a discussion last night with a guy. He's like, I don't even know what new music sounds like. Well, I can tell you it's very overproduced and industrialized. It doesn't sound like grunge at all. Matter of fact, a lot of it sounds like 80s rock played through a computer to magnify the sound a little bit. So, again, everything in life changes. Uh, but that was, again, 91 is the year when grunge really blew up. 92, of course, is the year that it ruled the world. Uh, but 90 was the year when rock music was ripe for change. And bands like Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, are the ones that ushered that change in. If you have ideas for the top 10 list, reach out and let us know. You can find me on all forms of social media at Scout Steve R. You can find Roy, the keeper of the list, at Dogmatic67. That's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. And uh, follow Roy on Spotify, and you can keep up all of our great lists, and they'll just populate right to your phone. Pretty cool thing. And thanks, as always, for your support of Top 10 List. All right, next segment of the show brought to you, as always, by Campus Bookmart, a Starkvillian institution. I love Campus Bookmart. I'm sure you do, too. If you have not frequented that location, let me encourage you to go by and check them out today. Campus Bookmart, selling the greatest in Mississippi State merchandise, the most expansive collection of Mississippi State merchant and on universe. If you can't make it to town to see their smiling faces, perhaps game day is not a good shopping day for you, Visit them on the World Wide Web, courtesy of Al Gore's internet, at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That's BSR. That stands for Beautiful Steve Roberts, and that gets you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. Any order less than 75 bones, absolutely incomplete. And right now, you know, it's summertime. You need some Mississippi State merch. You need to be thinking about your, uh, your football outfits Right? Be thinking about that. It's not just T-shirts and hoodies there. They have a lot of nice polos and button-ups, dresses, a lot of things for him and her. 
And so be sure and check that out today at campusbookmart.net. All right, let's take a, uh, a quick look around the league. Kind of a weird night in college baseball, especially for Southeastern Conference teams. Pretty rough night for the league in many respects. All right, Georgia. Of course, they had the big sweep over Arkansas. They get upset at home last night, 9-7 by Georgia State. Panthers beating out a dozen hits. And Georgia's always got pitching. It didn't show up last night. 9-7 win for Georgia State. Tennessee, our future opponent, no problem at all. And they brought the fur jacket back out. I didn't think we were allowed to do that, but they did. Fur jacket. So maybe Tennessee getting their swag back. 19-1 to winners over Bellarmine last night. The uh, Volunteers now 27-14 and in the league. And, of course, we're, we're not catching them at a good time. At home, after a huge sweep, you know, we wondered how they would be after Vanderbilt. That's why we play the games. I really thought Vanderbilt would win the series, and they didn't. Tennessee gets swept by Arkansas, then they sweep Vanderbilt. You know, they've been a little bit Jekyll and Hyde, so who do we see, you know? Interesting. Uh, Florida, really tough night last night, but they're able to pull it out. A 6-2 win over North Florida. Gator pitching a lot of 11 hits in the ball game, but just two runs. Kind of scattered those 11 hits, but uh, one Florida error in the ball game too. So, you know, good win for the Gators as they begin to prepare for the weekend. Uh, Louisville goes into Lexington. That's a rescheduled game, and they knocked around Kentucky midweek pitching 7 to nothing. That's a 21 versus 15 matchup. Louisville with 13 hits in the ball game. The Kentucky offense just kind of taking a flyer in this one. Just four run, four hits in the ball game, no runs. Alabama, a little bit of a struggle for a while, but uh, they win 13 to six. Alabama starting to piece it together a little bit here late. Now nine and nine in the league and 30 and 12 overall. But 13 to six winners last night. 24 hits in the ball game, 12 apiece for each team. Uh, you may have heard by now. Mississippi State beat Ole Miss two to one. Bulldogs 24 and 17 and 21 and 20, but uh, you know, Bulldogs they credit us with an SEC win last night. That's incorrect. The the SEC side has a sub seven and twelve, but we're actually six and twelve. Last night game did not count in Southeastern Conference play. All right, Troy. They go in and beat Auburn at Auburn eight seven. And doesn't that make the the series loss to Auburn sting that much more? It does for me. Maybe you feel differently. But the fact that Auburn drops that ball game and uh, three errors for Troy kind of allowed Auburn to stay in the game. Maybe Auburn not uh, feeling too good about themselves. But um, big win for the Trojans on the recruiting side of things to be able to say, hey, we went and beat Auburn at their place. Sam Houston State rolls into College Station, Texas, and just batters Aggie pitching for a dozen hits and nine runs. Aggies didn't help their cause with three errors in the ballgame, just two runs scored for AM. 9 2 winners are the Bearcats. Uh, good win for them. And I can't figure this AM team out. They have been just average in the midweek. I still think we can get those guys. Now, I won't be there for that series. I'll be on the uh, anniversary trip, so I'll depend on you guys to pull us through. Could be a huge series for Mississippi State's postseason prospects, but uh, you'll have to do it without me. Huge win last night, one of the biggest wins in the history of the Nickel State program is the Colonels go into Baton Rouge and Alex Box Stadium and beat number one LSU six to five. You think it only happens to us. It happens to everybody at some point. And Nichols wins the game on a base running blunder. Kind of a dying quail hit out there in the short center. The shortstop makes a diving catch. The LSU runner from second apparently thought the ball was down or lost track of the outs, breaks for third, and they doubled him off. The Nickel State Colonels stormed the field at Alex Box to celebrate a 6-5 win. And there's nothing fluky about it. Nickel State with 10 hits in the ballgame. LSU also had an error in the game, too. Uh, didn't really help things. But a huge win for Nickel State. Arkansas. Who can figure out Arkansas? Did Georgia break Arkansas? Missouri State host Arkansas last night, and for the second consecutive year, the Missouri State Bears beat Arkansas 8-4, to four, doubled them up in runs, doubled them up in hits, and to make matters worse, the Bears made three errors in the game. 
Arkansas. This game's not even close. Springfield, Missouri. I'm sure the uh, the beer flowed freely last night up there. But uh, pretty crazy night in the league if we talk about all these upsets, man. Pretty crazy. You know, it's like, what, five upsets in the league last night and a couple more that, that nearly were? Yeah. Nothing fluky about State beating Ole Miss, but goodness gracious, you look at some of these other ones and you think, how does this happen? All right, we'll, uh, we'll take a quick look at um, – you know, the series coming up, we'll get more in-depth on Friday. But uh, State and Tennessee begin on Thursday. And then an A&M at Arkansas, that's going to be interesting. I like Arkansas to win. You know, Baum is, is such a neutralizing deal. But if you're Razorback fans, you got to think, man, where is the consistency with this team? You felt so great. You had this big lead over LSU. Even though LSU had won the series, you take that – the three games from Tennessee, and you think, man, we're going to steamroll right on into a top eight national seed, and now you drop this ball game to Missouri State. That's four losses in a row. And A&M, they're so up and down. I think a and is good enough to get a split here. But uh, I like Arkansas to take a series. I do think Tennessee takes a series for us. I'm just hoping we can get a game. If we can get two, life is great. I'm just not expecting that. Maybe you are. I think you're preparing yourself for disappointment. Uh, but I'm expecting uh, Tennessee to take our series. Alabama is at LSU. And uh, personally, I think that uh, Alabama probably has their hands full at Alex Box Stadium. I won't be surprised at all if LSU sweeps the series. It would help us if they did. But, um, you know, Alabama playing some better baseball. They'll be really challenged this weekend. Uh, I could see Alabama getting a split. So we're going to call that two games to one LSU. Kentucky is at Vanderbilt. Huge series here for the Wildcats after they uh, lose two out of three to A&M. They got to go to Nashville. And this is a Vanderbilt team that's got a lot of talent that kind of got exposed last week on the bullpen side. Uh, in Kentucky, you know, four hits last night against Louisville, against midweek pitching, you kind of begin to wonder, you know, is Kentucky fading to 30 and 10, 11 and 7 in the league, three more wins in the SEC, and Kentucky is a lock for the tournament. They may be a lock at 13. But three more wins makes them 14 and 16 in the league. With 12 SEC games to go, they only got to go three and nine to make the tournament. They're going to make the tournament, as I've said all year. I'll be shocked if they don't. Uh, but this is a big one for them. And uh, Nick's a very, you know, tough guy. I know some of our fans don't like him. I love Nick. I love his approach to baseball. He's a little bit Bush League at times, so am I. But if Kentucky can go into Vanderbilt and get one, then they're two wins away with three weekends left. So it just seems to be – I know Brooks Bryant's my buddy, but Brooks and I go back and forth. He's always like, same old Kentucky. Well, you know, it's not going to be the same old Kentucky when they make the tournament. I don't know how long they last, but they're going to make the tournament. All right, Missouri is at Florida. As uh, my buddy Jason Caldwell pointed out, Missouri opens the series – opens the SEC slate with three wins over Tennessee, and they, they likely won't win ten games this year in the conference. Five and 13, and, of course, Florida embarrassed last weekend – Really, really hurt themselves last weekend. Um, but I don't think Missouri can hit Florida pitching. I don't. Maybe they get a game. I'll be shocked. I think Florida gets back on track this week. And I'm going to go ahead and call for the sweep here. Auburn is at South Carolina. That's a tough undertaking there. We saw what Auburn has on the pitching mound, and it's really not a lot. They've got some guys that can grind it out a little bit. And uh, they're both of their starters on Friday and Saturday did a good job against us. Uh, Vail specifically impressed me. But I think South Carolina offensively is just kind of rolling right now. And I think you're going to see South Carolina take this series. South Carolina likely sweeps this series. Uh, I just don't know what Auburn really has in its tank. I think we're going to look back because that's kind of a defining series in our season. That's how it feels. Uh, we mentioned A&M in Arkansas. And then Georgia's at Ole Miss. And uh, even talking to some of the Ole Miss people last night, I mean, the way Georgia's playing right now, how can you have any confidence? You know that Georgia's going to pitch it well. And uh, so these games will probably be somewhat low scoring. There's not a lot of length in this Ole Miss order, as we, if we've seen. There's just not a lot after you get through Calvin Harris and Kemp Alderman that, um, that really concern you. I think Georgia can swing it a little bit, uh, and I think they have an opportunity against this Ole Miss pitching staff that is pretty mediocre. Uh, I like Georgia to go into Oxford and take a series. I think it's a two-games-to-one type deal, but I do think Georgia 
is trending in the right direction. Ole Miss is not. And you got to think, you know, Ole Miss already guaranteed of a non-winning record in SEC play. And, it's, and the only way they get to 500 is to sweep the remaining 12 games. That's not going to happen. But you start thinking about this, all of a sudden you drop two games this weekend. That makes you 4-17 and 17 in this league with nine to play. 20 losses in a league seems to be an almost certainty uh, when you begin to kind of break that down because there's no way they're going to sweep those final three weekends. Now, it's, I know it's Missouri, Alabama, and Auburn, so it's some winnable series, manageable. I just begin to kind of question this Ole Miss team's medal a little bit. I know Bianco always seems to rally the troops, and they always seem to turn around in May, and the schedule's more favorable. But I think you're going to see your defending national champions post a 20-loss season, possibly – uh, 20 plus losses in the league this year, and and we're only that's, you're only six, right? You're six away. So if they go 500 in the final 12 SEC games, that makes them nine and 21. That's brutal. It is, and we've been there. We know, uh, but that's what you're looking at this weekend. And um, you know, Friday we'll have a lot more to talk about when it comes to those Thursday games, and uh, we've got a big one obviously coming up on Thursday. So we'll see what happens. Uh, spoke to uh, Chris Lamonis post game, and he did say we may get one arm back. That I, I suspect that's Landon Gartman. Kind of depends on how he reacts to treatment. And he said we'll have an answer for you on Thursday. Well, yeah, I bet you do because Thursday is the opening of the series. And so whether we find out in post game that Landon Gartman's going to pitch, maybe today we announce our pitching rotation. That's typically how it goes. But the reality of it is, the state's going to probably have to play our best baseball of the season to win this series. And if we do, it changes the fortunes of things in, in a very dramatic way. But when you start looking at this Tennessee team, and we're about to take a deep dive into them, that uh, this could be uh, one of those series you look I – mean, if we don't go up there and pitch well, uh, we're facing some trouble. Now, we're not walking people the way we have been. And if you look back here, what, what's happened with us is we've, we've had a train wreck ending in a couple of ball games here as of late. We didn't last night. We didn't on Friday, but you did on Saturday. You know, you're cruising there, about to put that thing away. And then, um, of course, you have uh, the big lead on Sunday and you blow it. So the bullpen's going to have to step up and be competitive. And, again, the thing that I share with you guys, we got two night games. The ball doesn't travel out to left. Travels a little bit out to right, but it doesn't travel out to left in Knoxville. Just be, remember that. It, it's almost like a, a force field out there in left field once the sun goes down. Just this time of year, that cold mountain air comes down and it keeps that ball in the ballpark. And so not a lot of home runs expected uh, to left Thursday and Friday night. Of course, you know, we say that and it may end up being a home run derby, but uh, that's been my experience and just kind of talking to some of our baseball people. We were down there in, eight, in 19. That's one thing they said is the ball just simply doesn't carry out to left uh, at night games. So we'll see how things go. But uh, really need State to come out here and bring our best baseball. And, again, uh, you know, I'll, as soon as we finish the show, I'll be packing the bag and hitting the road and uh, getting up there today. So we'll have the you know, chance to kind of enjoy some time with the wife and uh, enjoy the city of Knoxville. And uh, a lot of recommendations for dinner and that sort of stuff. And uh, I'm eager to get there. Uh, because I am that guy, I've already ordered some flowers. And I'll pick them up on the way to Knoxville. She lives out in the suburbs, you know, just temporarily because she, she lives here. But she's uh, you got a rental place up there while she's nursing. But uh, gonna stop by and pick her up some flowers. I got some cool things I'm bringing with her because uh, that's what I do. When you love people, that's what you do. And so um, getting up there today, and so we'll give you full coverage. Now it's important to understand too. There is some uh, precipitation in the forecast in the Greater Knoxville area Thursday and Friday. It doesn't look like it's going to be tornadic type weather but it could be wet. So we could see some delays. I think that actually hurts them worse than it hurts us, <laughs> Yeah, to be quite honest with you. Uh, but the reality of it is is that uh, their starting pitching has been a little bit up and down. they got some really talented guys, but their bullpen has been better as of late. And so we'll see how things go. But uh, I, I'm looking forward to the trip. I can't say that I, I'm optimistic about the weekend, but I am looking forward to getting up there and seeing how we compete. And uh, my hope is we'll stand up. And I guess I, I, I think about how that park plays well to left-handers. And we've got some real solid left-handers uh, in our 
in our lineup. And, you know, Hunter didn't have a great weekend last weekend against Auburn and, uh, you know, had a big swing last night. But uh, I, I look for Hunter to have a good weekend this weekend. Uh, maybe not a great weekend, but I think when you begin to think about, you know, Kellum, Luke, Ledbetter, you got a chance to maybe make some things happen out there. And uh, we should have swept that series in 19. You remember that's a series, too, where – uh, they penalized Peyton Plumley for throwing a ball out, didn't throw it back to the catcher, threw it straight to the dugout himself. They gift everybody two runs, so we, the two bases, so we end up losing the ball game by one run. That's not within the spirit of the rule. It's not. And uh, I understand afterwards we like we got a letter like, oh, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. But it, the reality of it is, is uh, yeah, Peyton's got to know better. But um, unfortunate situation to say the least. All right, final segment of the show brought to you by your friends at Portico. If you're looking to move to Starkville, and you certainly should, you certainly should, Portico is the place to live. Very easy to get to. Turn off 82 on a 12 like going to campus. The very first ride is Pat Station Road. You go through the four-way stoppers, Portico. I was about there yesterday. And so maybe this you've always dreamed of making your primary residence Starkville. The housing market here is amazing right now. And uh, so look into moving into uh, the coolest new place to live in Starkville. Just 1.1 miles away from all things Bulldog. How cool is that? Your friends, your family can all stop by and see you on their way to the game. Maybe spend the night with you. Wouldn't that be nice, Mom? Have all the kids under one roof on ball game weekends. Whether it be your investment property, perhaps your primary residence or second home, future retirement home, they've got a plan for you. Reach out to our friend Brooks Bryan a friend of Mississippi State Baseball, a friend to all Bulldogs, at 601-416-8075. Again, at 601-416-8075. Brooks can answer any question you have. They've got some partners they're working with. You want to to make Portico your next move? They can help you with that. They can guide you through the process every step of the way. You can start with a two-bedroom, two-bath home, go all the way up to a four-bedroom, four-bath home, and have everything in between. Phase one's completely sold out. Phase two, under development now. Many of those homes are sold, but there are some available. And maybe if you're not in any big hurry and you want to have some say in how the home is built, they can do that for you too. They can give you a custom build. You can pick out your lot and say, hey, this is what we want. It's not a cookie cutter community. Be sure and check it out. And again, hit Brooks up at 601-416-8075. Make Portico your next move. All right, in the time we have left, we're going to look at Tennessee. I had all this pulled up here because I was wanting to be prepared here. But uh, let's take a look at, uh, you know, Tennessee baseball. I don't know. Yeah, it's a, you have so many tabs open. Is it just me? Is it just me or do you do that too? I have always a lot of tabs open and sometimes I lose track. I lose track of what I had open and where I had it. But here it is. I found it. All right, so Tennessee opens up uh, in the, one of these little uh, MLB Desert Invitational Tournament and they drop the first two ball games to Arizona and Grand Canyon. Score a combined four runs, lose. They bounce back to beat University of California at San Diego, 7-0. Alabama A&M, they get them at Lindsey Nelson, 10-0 in eight innings. And then 23-1, and everybody's thinking, okay, Tennessee's rolling. They get Dayton, 12-2, 4-1, and 6 nothing. Allow three runs on the weekend. You think, okay, the ship has been righted. They get two midweek games against Charleston Southern, 6-1-8-2. Gonzaga goes in there and gets swept. Three-game series in Knoxville. Boston College, who has put together kind of a quiet resume out there, doing a pretty good job out there. Strike up the Eagles. The spirit of Doug Flutie guides them. Boston College goes into Knoxville and wins in 10, 7-6. Moorhead State becomes the, uh, the next victims. Absolutely abysmal weekend for them as their pitching staff gives up 35 runs. Lipscomb. 10-0 losers in Knoxville way back on March 14th. Then Missouri hosts Tennessee, and they sweep all three games, and really nothing fluky about it. 9-1, and then they didn't play Saturday, so they played two sevens on Sunday. And Missouri takes them both, 7-4 and 7-1. Think about that for a second. 23 runs for Missouri offense is pretty anemic against that, that Tennessee pitching staff. That's a pretty good job there. Tennessee scored just six runs on a weekend. 
They bounce back and beat Western Carolina 7 nothing, and then they host A&M, and they take all three of those games. All three of those games very competitive, maybe with the Friday game having a little separation at 10-4, but 8-7 and 9-6 winners in games two and three. They get UNC Asheville 5 nothing, and then it's an LSU series down there in Baton Rouge. Uh, they set the attendance record at Alex Box with 13-some-odd thousand, which is kind of like a Tuesday for us. But – uh, LSU takes the first two games, and then Florida, excuse me, Tennessee bounces back big on Sunday. That's been a question with LSU in game threes. 14-7 winners is Tennessee. And then they lose two out of three at home against Florida. Florida pitching carves them up for two nights, and they finally explode on, on the game three, which is a Saturday, and they 10-run rule Florida 14-2. They respond with a 10-run rule of Eastern Kentucky, in the midweek, and then they had to Fayetteville, Arkansas, and just a pretty anemic performance here. But uh, competitive ball games, and you'd expect that. But they lose 5 2, 6 3, and 7 2. Huge, huge, huge series win for Arkansas. And you think, okay, Tennessee's beginning to doubt themselves. Well, then they lose to Tennessee Tech. And nothing fluky about that, too. They get beat 12 to 5. And last weekend, they're limping into. Uh, you know, limping into uh, that series of Vanderbilt. And like many of you, I thought, you know what, Vanderbilt's going to kill these guys. They may run Tony out of town. And you start thinking here, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They lost six of eight games. And they sweep Vanderbilt. And, of course, Vanderbilt had the, the game basically won on Friday. Tennessee ties it, forces extra innings, and walks it off. And then they 10-run roll Vanderbilt on Saturday, 17-1 to in seven innings, and then went on Sunday, 10-5. Uh, and, again, we think it only happens to us. I mean, I, I, that's probably an article I can write next week since we don't have a midweek. How many teams in this league have been 10-run rolled this, this year in SEC competition? There have been a bunch of us. I mean, we just talk about it's happened to Vandy. It's happened to Florida. We know it's happened to us. Insanity. And, of course, they beat Bellarmine last night 19-1. So, in case you're, you're paying attention, first pitch on Thursday, 6 p.m., Friday, 5.30 Central, and then it'll be a 1 p.m. start on Saturday. So, we'll see. I may come back Saturday night. I may come back Sunday. I'm not going to be in any big hurry. Anytime I'm with the wife, is precious time, whether it be here, there, wherever. So, uh, important series. Now, uh, we mentioned before, we were both 5 and 10, and equally situated heading the last weekend. We dropped two at three-day sweeps. They're now eight and ten and have won four in a row. They are 25 and four at home. And let that sink in for a second. You know, very, very good. They have been terrible away from Lindsey Nelson. One and nine away and one and one in neutral games. Of course, you know, their non-conference games are all played at home. That's how it works. That's what they do. Creative scheduling, I guess we'd say. All right, let's look inside the numbers here. So, uh, on the hitting side of things, you know, still Tennessee. Not swinging it quite like they were last year, but um, still some power in this lineup, man. As a team, they've hit 84 home runs. have allowed 41. So, if it comes into a slugging contest, they're more than happy uh, to oblige you. Uh, Blake Burke leading the team with 14 tanks on the year. 33 RBIs. Guys hitting 327. And that's the thing. You look at this you know, as a team among the regulars. Uh, you've got three guys that are hitting about 300. You know, Dylan Dryling's hitting 324, but he's only got 18 starts. But he does see a pinch hit and come in and play some ball for him. Uh, but he's a guy, too, that um, not a full-time starter. Jared Dickey hitting 309. And then Hunter Ansley, uh, 302. It's a team that are hitting 286, which is good. Don't get me wrong. But maybe like, not like they were last year. Uh, but Blake Burke, in many respects, is the straw that stirs a drink. Now, Griffin Merritt, number 10 for them, he's got a dozen bombs. And outside of that, it's kind of equally spread. Zane Denton, just one big swing away uh, from hitting double digits himself. And then Jared Dickey's got eight. And so there's power up and down the order. But there's not as much length in the order as there was last year. I mean, no, nobody stays on top forever. And this Tennessee team, obviously, uh, very excited about life. 
But uh, remember my Ahuna, the big uh, the Kansas shortstop that we had all these issues with, with the tampering thing, and Tony was suspended, and there's going to be an NCAA sanctions case. Uh, he's played in 28 games, started 27. You know, he was ineligible much of the year. They finally got him going. Uh, but, um, you know, really not maybe having the year a lot of people expected. He's hitting 294. Pretty good year, but maybe not what they expected. He's got six tanks on the year, too. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how he plays against us. But um, uh, they run the bases a little bit. Maybe not as much as other people do. You know, it's like uh, maybe they're more like Ole Miss. And I tell you, I'll be honest with you, that Ole Miss team's not especially athletic. This Tennessee team is, but they're 42 of 51 in stolen bases. Against them, opponents are 42 of 47. So their opponents are actually still in bases at the, you know, a little bit better percentage than they are. Uh, the guy that gets after you a little bit is Christian Moore. And uh, you may recall Christian Moore, there was an incident where he was ejected. Uh, last weekend, Dollander gets bumped off a bag. Dollander doesn't say anything. Christian Moore felt like he was defending himself, and he kind of pulled his way, his arm away uh, from the official there and got ejected. I'm not exactly sure what the disciplinary action of that could be. Don't know. But that would be a significant situation if he missed any time in a ballgame. Uh, could be. Uh, Christian Scott, 7-7 seven of seven in stolen bases. And outside of that, it's, it's fairly pedestrian. Their team has ground into 18 double plays. They've only turned 17. But looking at this lineup here, um, you know, they'll get after you. Always been good mistake hitters. And, and when we start relying on a fastball, you know, we're kind of pitching into their wheelhouse here. Uh, looking here at the strikeout numbers, they've struck out 367 times. Their opponents, 469. 234 walks for Tennessee hitters. Tennessee pitchers have walked just 106, so they're going to be around the strike zone. A lot of people look at that and say, it's, you know, it's just over four to one. What that tells me is that they're going to throw strikes. And we got to take full advantage of that. Speaking of throwing strikes, let's look at pitching numbers here. Uh, Drew Beam, 10 starts on the year, a 5-2 and two record. Uh, 47 two-thirds innings pitch. He's allowed three tanks. Opponents are hitting 257 against him. So, among, you know, the regulars there, you know, he is the guy that's going to be around the plate, give you a chance to put the ball in play. Uh, Chase Dallander, he is an absolute dude. And when he is on, he is absolutely outstanding. He leads the staff with 54 and a third innings pitched, has an ERA of 381, also 10 starts, one complete game on the year, but just a 5-4 and four record. I think people expected bigger things from him. He has also had, while the average is down, like 221, he is a guy that will leave the ball up and challenge hitters. And so extra base hits are always a prob- probability with him. 21 extra base hits allowed, seven of them home runs. Uh, Chase Burns, his ERA is 515. Three and three on the year, eight starts. He's also a guy, too, that the average is uh, 228. But, man, when you start stacking these extra base hits together, people are getting around on him. 26 extra bases here, including nine home runs allowed, which leads a team. You remember uh, Seth Holverson? He was supposed to be the next big thing for them. Uh, he's 2-2. Two and two. He's allowed seven tanks this year, too. Opponents are hitting 215 against him. But he's another guy, too, that he'll lead the ball up. And uh, only you know 31 innings pitch. I'm sure we'll see him at some point. But this is a staff where the starting pitching has not been as good as advertised. The bullpen has. you got some guys in his pen that are really doing a good job for him. Uh, Xander Seacrest is a guy that we'll likely see uh, at some point. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. I mean, you never know how Tony's going to manage this thing, right? I mean, that's just kind of how it works. Uh, Seth Hoverson, of course, um, has got a couple of saves for him. But, uh, you know, he's a guy who will challenge hitters. But uh, I hope that we don't have to see him unless it's just trying to piece this thing together. But this is a staff that um, has not performed up to expectations. You want to look at Tennessee's struggles. That's where a lot of it has come is pitching. Let's look at SEC play for them. We'll start with our pitchers here. And let's kind of see. All right. Uh, so they're 8-10 in the league, obviously. Uh, the guys have gotten the starts, Drew Beam, Chase Dollander, 
Chase Burns has four starts. Andrew Lindsay has a couple. So a couple changes there on the weekend. But uh, Andrew Lindsay, 3.86 ERA, 0-1 record, 21 innings pitch, allowing just under a hit per inning. 29 strikeouts to five walks. That's a ridiculous, ridiculous, nearly 6-1. to one. And just four extra base that hits him in conference play. SEC opponents hitting just 213 against him. Uh, Chase Dollander, 4.73 ERA in SEC play. He's 2-3 and three in six starts. Has the one complete game. 32 and a third innings pitched against SEC opponents. Averaging just under a hit per inning. Uh, but this is a guy that's, you know, a lot of doubles allowed. As a team in SEC play, they've allowed 36 doubles. He's given up 11 of them. 39 punch outs to 14 walks. So a little bit under 3-1 to one there. We talked about Chase Burns a little bit earlier. His ERA is 8.10 in SEC play. That's brutal. But a 4-1 to one strikeout to walk ratio. But uh, nine home runs allowed on SEC play, which is the most on the staff. So basically what we have to do here is we're going to have to get a lead against their starters and then hope that our bullpen can hold it because their bullpen has been very greedy. They're not allowing much on the back end, especially here as of late. Uh, Kirby Connell is a guy that's kind of been one of their first guys out of the bullpen. Uh, he's got 10 appearances, but only four and a third innings pitched. Opponents are hitting 263, but he, a, a lot of work for him. Zach Joyce is a guy that's uh, kind of been hit or miss, just a one inning pitch for him. But we'll see how things go. You know, they've, they've kind of relied a lot on um, their starters to go deeper in the ball games and then have somebody bridge it to Holberson and then kind of hope for the best. But we're going to have to come out there and swing it. We're not going to win that game 2-1. to one. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. These guys are going to be a lot more offensive than what we saw last night. But, again, there is some swing and miss in this order. Taking a quick look at the time we have left here. Um, you know, strikeouts in SEC play, Tennessee striking out more than their opponents are. And Hunter Ainsley's got, uh, you know, 13. We talked about Ahuna, 24 punch outs in SEC play, which is the most on the volunteer team. Shows you it's a big difference between uh, Big 12 pitching and SEC pitching, right? Uh, Zane Denton with 22. You expect some of that, you know, with these power numbers. You expect, you know, these free-swinging guys. But uh, in, we talked about stolen bases earlier. Here's an interesting statistic. In SEC play, opponents are 25 of 26 – against the Tennessee defense. You know how many still on bases Tennessee has against SEC opponents? You want to take a stab at that? I'll tell you. Seven. Seven of 11. Jared Dickey's three for three. The rest of the team, four out of eight. So we've talked about our ability to control runners and sometimes our inability. We've been better as of late. Pitchers are doing a better job. Ross getting better too. And I think too, uh, kind of settling back there with Ross has been a good thing for his development, but also kind of gelling the infield. And so if this is a team that doesn't plan to run the bases a lot, I think that helps us. Because early in the year, as you guys know, a walk was a double. We've gotten better about that. Still, the numbers are terrible, but it's trending in the right direction. And this is a team that really hadn't run the bases a lot here in SEC play. So that's just a number to watch. we got to keep the ball in the ballpark we got a chance. Again, I don't expect us to win this series, but we got a chance. And I think this will be a competitive series. And, you know, if you have any pride at all, after what they did to us last year, came into Dirty Noble Field and beat us the way that they did, Coach Lamona shouldn't have to say anything. There shouldn't have to be any, okay, boys, let's go get them. There shouldn't be any of that. The leadership of this team has got to step up and say, you know what? Those guys came in here and embarrassed us and took pride in doing so. And we go, we owe them. We do. And uh, you know, it's with historic loss. You know, when you look at some of the numbers this year, you're like, well, you know, well, maybe it didn't sting so bad. No, it stung. It did. They beat us 27 to two. And then we came back on Friday, and they beat us four to three. And then, of course, the Saturday game was 10-5. And so we shouldn't be intimidated by the fact, oh, we got to go up there. Well, last time we went up there, we won a series and should have swept. Different team, different personnel. But all we remember from last year is that Thursday game and how bad that thing was. We forget the fact that we should have won the Friday game and we were in the Saturday game. And so the leadership of this team has got to step up and say, hey, listen, 
Let's go in here and get this thing done. Is this a winnable series? Yes, it is. Do I expect it? No, I don't. All right. Uh, if you haven't done so, go to dogpottlebook.com. You can get some of my sports books there. Uh, Starkville ones are sold out there. You'll have to find out in stores. But uh, plenty of dog pile. You can get signed copies there. Father's Day is coming up. Be thinking about Dad. Mom, too. I guess Mom would want it, too, for Mother's Day. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Alpha Dogs is there. Limited supply of Alpha Dogs. And, again, villains and alphas will go out of print this year. And uh, may do a short run next year, but no guarantee on that. And then, of course, uh, you can always get Flim Flam there. Still got a, I guess we've got a few hundred copies left, maybe. Uh, once we sell those, we may end up um, doing some other things. But uh, we're going to sit down soon and talk about what the next book may be. I got some ideas. And uh, Bloomsville Leander, always available at Amazon.com, BarnesNoble.com, BooksMillion.com, and Stark Villains Gear, available at StarkVillains.com. And if you're not a member of our happy family over at GenesPage.com, you should be. You should be. And here I was telling you guys I didn't think we'd go to full 90 minutes, and here we are. So I didn't shortchange you, even though I do need to get on the road. My hope is to be on the road by 10 o'clock, and uh, it's 927 here. So I'll go pack a bag, and I'll punch up the Boneyard article, and I'll hit the road. So I should be on schedule. And then all I've got to do from then is make it in Knoxville, pick up some flowers, and go see my lovely wife. And uh, she's on call tonight, so hopefully she doesn't get called in, and we can just hang and chill tonight, and then we'll go cover three college baseball games over the course of the next few days. And so those of you that are coming to the game, I look forward to seeing you. And those of you watching from home, uh, be sure and pull us through. I can assure you we'll be doing our best uh, to provide you the best coverage. I believe I'm the only member of the MSU beat going uh, to cover the ball games this weekend. So if you're – if you're looking for coverage elsewhere, you're not going to find it. The only place, the only boots on the ground are going to be my Timberlands at Lindsey Nelson, Nelson Field uh, covering Mississippi State baseball. Well, that's it for today. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.